future culmination and our present happiness all can be secured, understood, illuminated, and expanded only if we're willing to look at our relationship not only to altered states of consciousness, but to uh, the mind behind nature. Because that's really what this is all about, to my mind. Uh, what these psychedelics are empowering or conveying or revealing, depending on you know, how you come at it, uh, what they are showing us is that we are not alone upon this planet. We are not alone in the universe of mind. And I realize this is a soft audience to preach this in because there are probably people within the sound of my words who sincerely believe they were once citizens of Zeta Reticuli. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, it's, it's when, when the jar is so leaky, it's hard to know where to put the water. Uh, but I, I come to this as a show-me kind of guy. <laughs> and so, though my conclusions may sound as flaky as anybody else's, it was hard for me to get this flaky. <laughs> I, didn't, uh, I didn't embrace it. Uh, I was forced to it. And, and this method works, you see. I mean, there are two ways to get flaky. You can just get flaky, which takes no effort at all, you know. I mean, you just announce you're a walk-in, start eating wheatgrass juice, and, uh, you know, tithe to Maitreya. Or, or you can uh, get flaky by testing the edges, by stretching the envelope of being. And this works. For the most hard-headed among us, the aerospace insurance adjuster mentality is, is not only who I'm speaking to, but who I feel I represent. <laughs> because, uh, no kidding, really. Uh, <laughs> at, at age 18, I was a Marxist an existentialist. Uh, I had ambitions uh, in the field of aeronautical engineering, uh, so forth and so on. And I discovered that you can take that kind of a mentality out into the theater of real experience and you can come back a space bunny just like everybody else. <laughs> So, so what that means then is that uh, a, a straight person, and I speak as someone from the 60s with apologies to all our gay friends who later appropriated that word, because when I say straight, I mean unstoned. Uh, a, a straight person is not a guardian of truth or probity. A straight person is simply a, a frightened person proto-flake, <laughs> you see? <clears throat> I, always, I always think, and most of you have heard me say this, but when we get off on this subject, I always think about the wonderful thing Tim Leary said years ago. He said it so many years ago that when I told him how much I admired him for saying it, he didn't remember that he'd said it. <laughs> But the man once said, uh, wait till I give the line, uh, LSD is a drug which causes, occasionally causes psychotic behavior in people who have not taken it. <laughs> you see? And I certainly saw this. I mean, I, I saw my parents become violently psychotic uh, from not taking LSD. And, and so my point is, and I make it in a forum like this, because here we have so much permission for belief. 
I mean, you want to believe in, you know, channeling from beyond the grave? Fine, no problem. You want to believe in the healing power of nematodes, hematodes, hematite, you name it. We've got it all. Uh, really, I think that uh, the spirit of uh, childlike, untrammeled curiosity is what we're striving for. Not the anal retentive, uh, rational person. Not the all go for anything channeling flake, but an attitude of we don't have to look far for miracles because they're all around us. Everything is astonishing. The universe on its surface is alive with mystery. Well, how do we make our way toward that when we live in a culture, practice a language, embody a philosophy, scientific rationalism, which is entirely designed to suck wonder out of reality, to turn everything into shades of gray, to uh, uh, subvert all hope that lies outside the realm of career accomplishment and material possession. Well, the way that we can overcome this is through a personal um, acting out of what I have been calling now for several years the archaic revival. And I want to talk about that a little bit this evening because I think it you know, however much we may kid around about the New Age, uh, it is an important aspect of what is going on. Its triviality is rooted in the side of it which is ungrounded, ephemeral, and uh, self-promoting. But it springs from a fairly profound and deep sense that things are not all right in this society. Uh, I think that I first encountered the phrase New Age in the writings of Helen Petrovna Blavatsky. She wrote in the 20s. I read her in the 50s. Uh, the New Age has been with us for a long time, so long that there's nothing new about it. And in fact, the reason I call it the Archaic Revival is because I think we can understand this movement if instead of accentuating what about it that is new, novel, and never before seen, instead we emphasize that this is a profoundly conservative impulse. A, a conservative impulse that would set the hair of George Bush and his skull and bones buddies standing on end. Because when we talk about conservative, we're not talking about returning to the era of Eisenhower. We're talking about returning to the era of Isis, Asarte, uh, the great horned goddess of the high Paleolithic. In other words, uh, this program of material civilization, exteriorization of ideas into matter through first alchemy and magic and then science and industry, this process is coming to an end one way or another. We are either going to plant ourselves and most of the rest of the life on this planet by blindly pursuing this cultural model until we run it right over the edge into the apocalypse or from the genes, from the bones, from the oceans, from the forests, from the glaciers, there is going to have to come a turning point, a change, a revulsion so profound that it allows us by the tens of millions to change how we think about reality, to change how we live.